Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Piancy. I'm joined as usual by my partner in crime, Mr. Bennett Tomlin. How are you today? I'm doing well. How are you, Cass? Good. It's been an exciting week. We are joined by a very special guest, actually fourth time appearing on the show in Wait, some way, shape, time. or form. Yeah, if you, you count you the panel. Count the panel, which you were uh, a part of. David Z. Morris, welcome back to Crypto Critics Corner. Thank you. And welcome. Honor. Incredible. He has, he's been uh, writing for Protos and kind of covering the SBF trial for Protos. So it's been wonderful having you on the Protos team, David. But actually, maybe we should start off there. How did you wind up writing for Protos? What's going on over at Coindesk? Let's right. let's talk about it. Yeah, I think some people will know and some people will not. There was a big round of layoffs from Coindesk about uh, six weeks ago now, seven weeks ago, um, and unfortunately, I was impacted. Um, there's a there's a whole behind the scenes story that I can't go into too much. But as people know. Coindesk is a uh, is a subsidiary of uh, Digital Currency Group, which was pretty uh, significantly impacted by a lot of crypto crashes that we caused. Question mark. <laughs> um, and uh, so, you know, I, I've been talking to some of my colleagues and saying that there needs to be some sort of equivalent to, like, the Silver Star or the Purple Heart for journalists who lose their jobs because they destroyed the organization that they were working for. <laughs> well, and I've also been excited just to add before we get any further to have um for you to have had more time to contribute to your personal newsletter, Flesh Markets, ah. where you get to cover some of the more esoteric but interesting stuff that just can't get editorial approval at other outlets. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thank you. And I guess right up front, I can say um, I, I would be really awesome to have more people sign up. Um, it's just davidzmorris.substack.com, and uh, you get a uh, bi-weekly subscriber-only crypto news roundup, although right now it is mostly SPF trial. Lots of lots of good stuff there. Uh, it's been really exciting to uh, see it grow, and, and I have gotten a lot of a lot of great feedback, so it's nice. Uh, and we're going to link to that Substack in the show notes and in the if you're listening to this on a podcasting platform, I will be linking to it there as well. Um, so it'll be easy enough to find David's Substack and uh, also his coverage of the trial so far for um, Protos. So we'll, we'll be linking yeah. to all of that good stuff. But now right. let's get to the um, the main course of our discussion, which is yes. the trial and how hectic and wild this has been. Um, why don't you start us off, David? You've you've been there firsthand. Uh, wherever you want to start. Why don't you just yeah. go, go for it? Yeah, so we just finished the first week. Um, there was no trial on Monday, but Tuesday started with jury selection, which um, was interesting, but also I got a lot of reading done, which I think is actually going to be a theme for a good bit of the trial. And then we really like went off to the races. Um, we The first uh, the first witness was Adam Yadidia, who was one of the de the developers, uh, fairly high ranking. He lived in the Bahamas penthouse with, with Sam Bankman Fried and was a uh, longtime friend. Um, he crucial, well, we'll go into more depth, but he's a little bit different from some of the other witnesses because he's not testifying under a plea deal. He hasn't pled guilty to any crimes. So the, the prosecution started off with a witness who's not implicated in, in anything that's going on particularly. Um, after they did that, actually start off with a cocoa commodities trader, if I recall, right? Like everyone seems to have right, just sorry. skirted, skirted yes, over that. Right. It's okay. I actually saw a bunch of videos say the same exact thing. Um, but I know he wasn't a very impactful witness. Uh, he basically was just saying that he, as a professional commodities trader, cocoa trader, um, had fa fallen for the hype of of what SBF had put out there and, and FTX. It, he'd, he watched the Super Bowl ads and... And mm -hmm. put his money on there. But yeah, yes, and, and that was actually kind of significant just as a thing for the prosecution to establish, which is that this, this was a customer, somebody who had used FTX, talked about the marketing, talked about why he, a professional, trusted the platform. Um, and, and that sort of establishes the grounds for, for a lot of the fraud charges. So, yeah, that, that was the first... Adam, you did a second. Third witness was a guy, uh, Matt Huang of Paradigm, which is a crypto venture fund, took the stand to talk about how they got robbed. Um, and then, yes, we we wrapped up um, the week with uh, Gary Wong, the co-founder of, uh, of FTX and Alameda Research. And Gary's testimony was definitely the bombshell of the week. Um, and we'll get into it, but I think the totality of the situation is that things are going very badly for Sam. Um, and there was even some drama in the courtroom that seemed to reflect that people understood that. 
um, which I think we will also get to. Yeah, so jumping back to that, uh, I haven't been in the courtroom like you have, but I've been reviewing the coverage and the transcripts and some of that. And the opening statement for Sam Bankman Freed's lawyers struck me when they were going over it because it made a variety of incredibly strange arguments, at least to me as a layperson. None of mm. us on this call are a lawyer, just to be clear for anyone listening. But um, argued in the opening statement that Alameda Research had billions in profits, said Alameda Research was a totally legitimate payment agent for FTX that everyone was fully aware of, and then even tried to make the excuse that FTX was a bank and that a bank run is what occurred, mm -hmm. which is surprising to me because I missed them getting that charter, but apparently their lawyer found it. Do you have any thoughts on kind of that opening? <laughs> Well, one notable thing about kind of being in the courtroom is that at this point, I'm not really yet looking back at anything. Um, so I was there for the for the statements and I found them. Uh, I found the defense statement quite weak. Um, the, the bank run thing definitely jumped out at me. And, and of course, uh, you know, that is the uh, side of the debate that Michael Lewis is on, which maybe we can talk a tiny bit about either here or elsewhere. And also just more generally, I think that... Um, you know, the way to think about those arguments is not so much that they're actual arguments that the defense is going to be able to make over the course of the trial um, for the reasons that I'll for reasons that I'll get into, but they are means of sowing doubt. The defense's only real tactic so far has been to and, and you know, this is legitimate, right? On in a criminal case, the standard is you have to establish beyond a reasonable doubt that somebody is guilty. And so the, the defense is, is focused on creating that reasonable doubt. Um, it's, it's pretty much failing to do so, so far. And I think the, the opening statement kind of previewed um, that, you know, they're, they're, they are kind of grasping at straws. Um, for, for those who don't know, the defense witnesses were all denied. Uh, basically, they submitted a list of witnesses that was almost exclusively, as far as I could tell, subject matter experts, finance professors, and other people who had no real specific knowledge of what was going on. Um, and the, the judgment in that case was that, you know, these witnesses are only going to confuse the issue because they're going to be talking in theoretical terms um, rather than speaking to any substance. And so that means the defense doesn't actually have any witnesses to call. There, there might be um, some opportunities for them to go back to that initial witness list and and get some people in. Um, but I think at most there were like two names that they were given the option to recall um, as responses to government witnesses. Um, so, so they're really relying on their cross-examination to, uh, I, again, almost exclusively to sow doubt about the witnesses. Um, and that has included both with Adam Yadidia and Gary Wong talking about um, the deals under which they are uh, testifying. And in Adam Yadidia's case, the first you know, major witness, I would say, I think that fell really flat in a way that might wind up harming the entire defense. Um, because as I said, Yadidia did not plead guilty to anything, but he was testifying under um, an immunity agreement. That is, he um, anything he said could not be used to charge him with a crime. He has not been charged with a crime, but the, the agreement just prevents him from being charged based on his testimony. However, and, and the prosecution has done this very effectively, both with Yadidia and with Gary Wong, they are actually bringing up these agreements first um, and emphasizing the fact that what nullifies the agreements is if the witnesses are found to have lied. Um, so somebody like Adam Yadidia is now completely not charged with any crime, Anything he says cannot be used to charge him with a crime on the stand. Um, but if he lies, that agreement is nullified. And the same goes for Gary Wong, who actually faces, you know, decades in prison for the stuff that he's charged with. Um, so, you know, if you give the jury a benef the benefit of the doubt that they're at least slightly thinking these things through, um, it, it really undermines the fundamental argument of the defense that is trying to imply basically that these people are just saying what the government wants them to say because they were offered a deal. Um, and that's really one of, frankly, only two legs that the defense is standing on right now. And that, so that's a really compelling point that you're making and uh, piggybacking off of that in a sense here. Um, I think the two, one, some of the more dramatic flubs that have been pointed to publicly, um, the one that I remember distinctly, uh, and I don't know if this played out similarly in the courtroom, but the one I remember distinctly is he didn't buy a yacht, did he? 
uh, which right. was what the defense team essentially said to, I don't know if it was Yedidia. I think it was y- Yedidia where they- It was they, Yedidia, yeah. Where they were saying he owns a Toyota Corolla. He's Obviously, he's not taking in all this wealth just to buy fancy crap for himself. He didn't buy a mm-hmm. yacht, did he? Uh, and I think the other flub that everyone's been noticing or that has been sticking out for everybody is that the judge is basically not having any of this, that there's been a lot of repetition, that there's been some mm-hmm. borderline hearsay attempts for witnesses and, and other stuff, um, uh, and that the judge is saying, yes. you guys better fucking cut this out right now. But uh, yeah, can you t- can you talk about those? Yeah. Those moments. So there's actually three things, because I want to talk about the hearsay thing and, and see if I can pull out the details, because that was a pretty nuanced one. Um, yeah, but the uh, the questioning of Yadidi about Sam's spending was honestly hilarious and really made the defense seem, I, I think I just have to say, like, not that competent. Um, and it's, it's surprising because uh, this is the firm of Mark Cohen and a guy named Christian Everdell. Um, and Everdell is handling most of the cross-examination so far. And it was Everdell who uh, pursued this line of questioning with Yadidia and was asking, yes, did he buy nice clothes? Did he buy a nice car? Did he buy a yacht, right? Um, and of course, uh, Yadidi was saying, you know, not that often. I think they also during this question, or um, Yadidi was saying like, no, he just dressed in cargo shorts and a t-shirt. Um, and, and I think the really incredible part that seems to show some real lack of comprehension by the, the defense is that the defense then pulled up a piece of evidence that was the infamous photo of Sam Bankman Fried on stage with Bill Clinton and Tony Blair at Crypto Bahamas last year. Um, now, they pulled up this, this photo because Sam Bankman Fried in that photo is sitting next to Bill Clinton in cargo shorts and a T-shirt. So the defense is doing this to try and show he's just a regular guy. He's not embezzling money. Look at him. He's looking. But he's next to Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, guys. How do you think he got on that stage in a t-shirt and cargo shorts? <laughs> do you think the jury is morons? Like they they know influence peddling when they see it. Do you not? And the other point at which this is a complete disaster is that there's what's known as redirect. So cross-examination is after the prosecution has asked questions um, because these are all prosecution witnesses. So the prosecution goes first, asks questions, defense gets to cross-examine, and then the prosecution gets to come back for what's called redirect, which is they have to address issues that the defense raised in their cross-examination, and they can essentially rebut. Now, the rebuttal for this line of questioning that the prosecution came back with immediately was to ask Yadidia, have you heard of FTX Arena? And at this point, I was in the actual courtroom. Sometimes I'm in the overflow, but I was in the actual courtroom, and the actual courtroom burst out all of it. I could not control myself. I laughed. Everybody laughed because we all knew where this was going, which is that Yadidia said, yes, I've heard of it. We paid $100 million for the naming rights for the former Miami Heat arena. And again, it seems like the defense's tactics are built on the assumption that the jury is stupid, um, which is to say that they think that this guy's personal spending is the full sum of what he did with $8 billion. And so that was that was pretty bad. The hearsay issue was interesting, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to pull the details back up from memory. But effectively, um, I think this was with maybe we shouldn't go too deep into this because I'm not even remembering whether it was Yadidi or, or Wong. But essentially, the defense was looking at the transcript of testimony that one of the witnesses gave mm. to, I believe, the FBI immediately after the shutdown in December was asking them what they had said at the time. And then when they did not produce the response that the defense was hoping for, the defense began reading their past statements to them from the transcript and asking them, did you say this? Um, and that is essentially putting words in the, the witness's mouth. The judge immediately cut this off very sternly. Um, and it was part of a much larger pattern where the defense was getting constantly shut down on its lines of questioning as, you know, whether they were leading the witnesses. Whether, and of course, um, Cass, as you point out, uh, the, the big one was repetition. And it really feels like the defense is just killing time because a substantial portion of the cross-examination with the major witnesses so far has just been the defense re-asking the same questions as the prosecution with no apparent purpose at all, as far as I could tell. Um, and and that's it, upsetting uh, the judge. There was like a whole sidebar with Cohen about it on day two, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> it, he got it right 
from the start. And then, you know, after that sidebar on day two, um, it has continued to happen. The judge has continued to reprimand. This is Everdell who's really doing it. I mean, Cohen was brought up for the sidebar, but Everdell has been the one doing the cross X. It's in fact, on Friday, it was to such an extent, I, I haven't looked back at the transcript, so I don't have the exact wording, but Everdell, as we got, we had recess early on, uh, on Friday because a juror had travel plans. So we were going to wrap up at 2 PM and it was 1:50, and Everdell started doing this. He started like repeating the, the prosecution questions and the judge at this point just interrupted him and said, Mr. Everdell, it appears you're just trying to kill time until 2 p.m. Why don't we just break? And Everdell was like, OK, you got me. That's exactly what I was trying to do. Let's break. And so we left at 150. And, and the other thing to point out, and I think this is the right point to, to point it out, is that you can hear all of this and maybe somebody in the audience is thinking, oh, but, you know, maybe they were making some legal point, making some argument that, that we don't quite understand yet. And that is possible, but also irrelevant. Um, one of the nice parts of being in the courtroom is that I'm there with a bunch of other very, even far more experienced court reporters who have watched a lot of trials. And one fella who I um, have found very knowledgeable told me uh, that a jury trial is a lot like, like a presidential election. The winner is often the person who the jury wants to have a beer with. In some ways, it might seem like it's not real justice, but it is also because jurors are smarter natively than I think you might give them credit for. These interruptions, the judge reprimanding, the defense counsel, all of this, I think, boils down to the jury having less reason to trust defense counsel and in turn less reason to trust uh, Sam Bankman Freed. So I think it's all very bad for him. I think one of the most impactful pieces of testimony so far, in my opinion, has been the testimony of Gary Wong. Can you talk a little bit about what he testified about, especially the relationship between FTX and Alameda Research? I believe this is new information. But Gary testified that as early as late 2019, Alameda was already effectively tapping customer funds um, because Sam had personally authorized the use of FTT tokens held by Alameda as leverage for what amounted to margin loans on FTX. Um, so there are various interpretations of this. But I think one very straightforward one is that FTX was a fraud from almost the very beginning. FTX was founded in the, the last few months of 2019. And within a couple of months, they were already having to use customer funds to underwrite Alameda. And this is staggering because what it means is that Alameda was very bad at trading crypto, even in the lead up to a real mega bull run. Um, and well before, by the way, Carolyn Ellison was co-CEO with Sam Tabasco. Um, so, you know, we have a, uh, a, a real pattern here. And I think, again, very devastating for, for Sam Bankman frieds defense. Yeah. And I have some of this open in my notes right now um, because I covered the defense's opening statement in my newsletter for this week. And the comment, like I mentioned before, that stuck in my head was their billions of profits. So just to kind of help with the timeline a little bit here, Alameda Research was founded in 2017. They were initially funded by a large like $110 million loan with a 40-ish percent interest rate based on reporting from Semaphore. In early Largely 2018, from effective altruists, by the way. Yes. That's right. Yes. Uh, this loan gets called in in early 2018, which leads to some of the early members of Alameda Research quitting, including Tara McAlee, the co-founder who eventually cites risk management and ethics mm -hmm. issues. In 2018, the Wall Street Journal has reported that Alameda Research lost about two-thirds of their total assets on a bad XRP bet. Now we have the new testimony from uh, Gary Wong saying that in late 2019 or early 2020, Alameda Research starts pulling from FTX customer assets by effectively putting FTT up as collateral at an unreasonable rate in terms of how it was mm -hmm. calculated for the collateral. In 2021, we see the bad bet on MobileCoin where they fat fingered and ended up needing to have FTX step in reportedly. 2021 tax returns for Alameda Research and FTX show billions of dollars in losses. 2022, we have the Luna and Terra collapse along with three hours capital resulting in all the loans being called in, which 
involved them taking more customer mm -hmm. funds, allegedly, of course, to pay back those loans. And during this period, they're valuing the FTT they're using as collateral at more than the entire market cap for FTT. And like the reason I'm belaboring this timeline oh right God. now is because I think it's kind of important to emphasize that from 2018 through 2022, it's not clear there was ever a year where Alameda Research was actually making the billions in profits that their lawyers are claiming, right. that Sam is still claiming. It's not clear that at any point this was very much a like legitimate successful business. Points towards the creation of FTX being perhaps not motivated purely by a desire to create mm -hmm. an effective cryptocurrency exchange. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, and let me let me jump in real quick and provide one other bit of clarity about the early days and kind of how Sam was thinking about this according to Gary's testimony, which is in itself staggering. So what Sam told him about Alameda's deficit, according to Gary, was that it, they could be allowed to run a deficit as long as it was not higher than the trading fees that FTX was making um, up to that point. This is insane. Basically, what Sam is saying is that as long as FTX is making a profit, those profits can be funneled directly into Alameda by way of a deficit. Like, this makes no sense, and I right. don't understand why he would even think it made sense. Oh, and it, it does do. speak to – well, I mean, I get in the, in, the, he, in the bigger picture, but if you're actually he, running he, a business – He plotted an exponential curve – and then just plugged that into a bad expected value calculation right, and says, right. yeah, that number's positive, not negative, so we should do this. That's all that happened. <laughs> There's an, another point that's come out is the insurance fund has been questioned and how the insurance fund was calculated. Um, and in case anyone is unfamiliar, mm -hmm. in case anyone doesn't actively trade on any of these um, kind of bucket shops, the concept including for BitMEX and, and other cryptocurrency exchanges, is that with these transactions, with all of these trades that are ongoing on your exchange, you take some of these fees that you're accumulating, you pile them into this big, like the Seifu fund uh, over at Binance, and um, you basically do this so that you can tell customers, look, if there's ever a hack, if there's ever any kind of loss, if, uh, if somebody freezes some token or something, we can, we can cover losses up to a certain point. But it turned out that they were calculating this with just random numbers. There was no reality to the insurance fund numbers that they were coming up with. It was like mm -hmm. times 7,500, I like ridiculous, just totally invented. But this brings me to, you mentioned Michael Lewis. Um, Michael Lewis came out with uh, his book, Going Infinite, which has been widely sort of lampooned within the financial industry. Outside of that, publicly, it seems like some people are into it, but that's fine. It depends on what you think. But regardless, two things here. You mentioned that, you know, the defense is trying to sell a story, essentially. They want you to believe Sam is the guy that you want to go out and have a beer with, as opposed to whatever the prosecution is throwing out there um, to not establish that. Meanwhile, I think we have Michael Lewis saying, we've got this exchange. The exchange was always profitable. I was sitting there. I could see these books. I know that it was what it was. And yet everything that we're hearing says otherwise for all of this, whether mm -hmm. we're talking about the, the, the mm -hmm. story being painted of who SBF really was, or whether we're talking about what kind of risk profiles these these executives were taking, how they conducted themselves, how they even determined what was acceptable levels of risk. It's all total fluff nonsense. Do you think there's any redemption arc here? What do you think the defense could do to, to push back on what we're all seeing? I don't know if it's obvious to the jurors, but... Well, we have Carolyn coming up on Tuesday, probably. And it really seems likely that they are going to really work hard to throw her under the bus. Um, and, and that, I think, is um, the only... It's the only narrative Sam has offered, basically, is that Alameda losing all that money sent FTX into a tailspin. And then you just like have, it's like the underpants gnomes. It's like Alameda lost all that money. No explanation for why Alameda had all the FTX money in the first place, but out of business. Um, and, and that I think is the is the sleight of hand that the, the, the defense is going to rest on is basically saying that FTX collapsed because Alameda was bad at trading. Um, they've mentioned at least once that Sam recommended Carolyn put on a hedge at a certain point. 
um, and she didn't. Um, and, and that, I think, um, you know, whatever relevance that has, they're going to make a big deal out of it. Leaving aside the fact, by the way, that uh, that also put Sam Bankman Fried in the chain of command for a an entity that he was not supposed to have any influence over. And in mm. fact, whose, you know, lack of his influence over it was part of how they marketed and defended the entire arrangement that led to the creation of these two companies. So, you know, the, the defense is hung on its own petard, whichever way it turns, um, because their only way of claiming that um, that Carolyn was somehow the culprit was you know, that includes saying that Sam was actually in charge of Alameda. I do also want to speak to the Michael Lewis thing specifically. The quality of the book and, and the quality of the narrative is one thing, but it has been honestly shocking. And, and you know, I, I idolize this man, to be clear. Like, he's one of my, you know, one of the most people I hold in the highest regard, perhaps, in the world until about a week ago. But he is now saying in public that he intends his book to be a, quote, letter to the jury. And we already have a serious problem with jury trials in the U.S., which is that it's basically impossible for a jury to be sequestered from outside information. Um, and here we have an influential finance writer who's saying he's actually trying to engage in what amounts to jury tampering from outside the courtroom. Um, and that I think should be distressing as far as the substance and, and the explanation of what's going on there. I think it's a lot of Freudian psychology, frankly, um, with, uh, Michael Lewis and his self-conception. Um, there's a, there's a lot more to be said about that, but it's a, it's a sub issue. I think the real question is like, buddy, you should not be trying to influence the jury. It's not what you're here for. Some of the things he said about Zeke, Zeke Fox, friend of the show and author of Number Go Up, a brilliant book that I recommend everybody check out. Uh, the mm -hmm. stuff he said about Zeke, the stuff he's saying about O'Hare, uh, the the lad who's featured in The Blind Side. Um, and, oh, uh, I hadn't yeah. heard that, but boy, it's been a bad month for him. <laughs> yeah, he, he basically said that that dude has suffered, I mean, I... I want to say that this is hyper hyperbole that I'm I'm saying here, but he basically said that he's been hit in the head too many times and he's suffered a personality change, um, which I don't know why you're fucking saying that out loud, whether you believe it or not. Um, I recommend shutting your fucking mouth and not, mm -hmm. you know, not not talking about There's CT that in, in that way. Um, yeah, I, it's 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 pretty despicable stuff. And like you said, somebody who I had a ton of respect for, even just as a storyteller, whether or not you believe every story that he's told, um, you know, a lot of respect for that guy. And he wiped it out very quickly just by opening his mouth in these interviews, um, regardless yeah. of how I feel about his book, which I didn't like either. Sorry, tangent, my own <laughs> my own <laughs> um, vitriol coming out a little bit there. But um, yeah, so I, you know, let's get, let's get back to the trial here. I agree with you that you don't you shouldn't be writing letters to the jury um, unless you've been literally asked to do so by the prosecution or defense. Um, and usually that comes in during sentencing and not during uh, the actual trial itself. I'm curious what your thoughts are going forward here. As you said, we've got Caroline coming up, got a lot of other witnesses to go through as well. Um, what do you, what do you expect to see in the next week? Yeah, I think that, um, yeah, Carolyn's next. That's going to be the big day. I get to be at the courthouse at 4 a.m. to try and get into the actual courtroom so I can see all the action. I, I frankly don't have a great big picture view of the way things are going to go. Obviously, we still have um, Nishad Singh on the docket. He's the third guilty plea co-conspirator major figure. And because I mentioned Nishad, I'm, I'm backtracking a little bit, but it was very interesting listening to, to Gary Wong's testimony and describing... You know, it was very boring in some ways. He was describing in huge detail how he and, you know, Yadidia was involved in this to some extent too, how they, in the process of recoding certain payment APIs within um, FTX's code base, discovered how much money Alameda was, was extracting. And there were these series of meetings, like emergency executive meetings that Gary Wong described. And the attendees were Carolyn Ellison, Gary Wong, Nishad Singh, and Sam Bankman-Fried. None of those people is an accountant. It does not appear there were any accountants involved anywhere in the the process of keeping track of how much, how many billions of dollars FTX was in the hole to FT, Alameda. Um, 
like we were seeing these, you know, you remember the infamous SBF balance sheet that he posted that was like, maybe we have a few of these. I don't know how much this is worth, but it was like in an Excel spreadsheet so that it like sort of had some superficial form to it. Uh, a lot of those were taken from internal documents uh, or sorry, we saw a bunch of internal documents during the trial that basically made it look like that was actually an accurate representation of how accounting was done at FTX. It was just spreadsheets. And you would even have, in a couple of cases, you had two different versions of a spreadsheet trying to calculate the same thing. Gary would do one, Nishad would do another, and they would arrive at a different number. And they would just kind of decide which number was actually correct. Um, and that just seems to be the way things went. So Nishad is coming up. We'll get another viewpoint on some of those meetings. We will, I think, uh, still get some testimony from Zach, Pr Zach Prince, I believe his name is, the uh, CEO of BlockFi. And so we'll get more from defrauded individual investors, defrauded equity investors, and people who like BlockFi. I, I assume BlockFi lent money to Alameda for trading purposes, so they were defrauded in that way. I think just to, just to push back there for one second, I think what really happened with BlockFi is that FTX came in, Alameda came in as the rescue they they came in to rescue BlockFi ah, okay. because their right. lending I'm product right had now. blown up and they were like, oh, we're going to take care of everything, we promise. And in reality, they were just desperately wanted to access those customer funds. And so then they started taking the customer funds and using them for whatever they wanted. Am I getting that right, Bennett? I haven't been reading all the BlockFi bankruptcy filings like I have for FTX, but I think there was some detail about how when FTX came in with the rescue offer, Alameda Research still had some loan outstanding and like the payoff of that loan was mm. structured into the offer combined with like some kind of performance standard that they were unlikely to meet which made the total outlay from FTX like likely to actually be small and like there was a bunch of weird structural issues in that deal that might yeah. come in I can't I, I I have this feeling but I can't remember the details that BlockFi was one of the last loans Alameda still had not closed. They had mm. successfully used the customer funds to close out right. most of their other loans from other lenders. So BlockFi might be being called as one of the defrauded lenders related to that conspiracy right. charge on Sam's list of charges. It's all interrelated. It's all very incestuous, obviously. So as we wrap this up for so we can keep it tight and get it out, I think that one other thing that people are going to be interested to hear about is that um, you know, during this frankly disastrous cross-examination of Adam Yadidia, which ultimately culminated in the uh, the prosecution getting a laugh line by mentioning FTX Arena, early in that cross-examination uh, was was really the first major moment of in courtroom drama that I saw, which was Barbara Freed seems to have either broken down crying or come very close. Um, I was sitting across the aisle from her um, and she sort of lowered her head during the cross-examination, took her glasses off, balled up her fists and like pushed her, her eye sockets into her fists like this. And she was kind of down in her own lap, curled over for, you know, a, a few minutes and did it a few times during the cross-examination. And at the same time, um, Joseph Bankman, Sam's father, kind of had his head down in his hand, whereas for most of the duration, they've both been very alert, very you know, upright, they're taking notes. And so my interpretation of that, um, you know, whether she was crying or suppressing crying, she seemed very upset. And in the context, the conclusion that I had to draw was that she maybe was noticing that the defense was not doing great. And, you know, it's it's one of those moments where as we talk about the the courtroom experience and the fact that I'm there, those are those are the moments that we're there to see. And it really raises a lot of sort of more complex questions on the human level, right? Because these are, you know, people in their late 70s who are, I think, genuinely suffering, whatever they might or might not have allegedly done as part of this crime. And I think that um, that, you know, I have to be even handed here. I think that that actually could have an impact on the jury, especially since the jury and will not be allowed to, to learn any of the allegations now uh, coming out around the parents themselves. And so, you know, I think that uh, that could be a factor. It could be a factor, even if she is not a manifestly terribly sympathetic person. As a last statement for me, um, is that uh, Liz Lopato, who's covering this for The Verge, mm -hmm. she mentioned in one of her articles, which again, I hope we can link to in show notes, she mentioned that a lot of it felt like the defense team was already preparing for the appeals. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, mm -hmm. it that feels right. I, I don't know. I'm not there. You're there, David. But it, fe it feels right to me that like they know 
they're hobbled when it comes to actually providing a real defense for this stuff. And at this point, it's more like, fuck, can we figure out some way to get an appeal to actually work functionally? Mm -hmm. Um, And they're just racking their minds trying to figure it out. It wouldn't surprise yeah. me if that's indeed the case. She's a more sophisticated legal observer than I am, frankly. She she covered the Elizabeth Holmes trial, so she knows this stuff uh, a little better than I do. So I think the fact that she's thinking ahead to appeal is, is more than had occurred to me. If, to me, it just seems like they've given up already because they're just not trying anything. They don't have any witnesses to build a, an alternate narrative with. They really don't have... They, they have not been able to paint any clear picture in the jury's mind, as far as I can tell, of an alternate explanation for anything that happened besides the one that the prosecution has already painted very clearly. So all they can do is kind of chip around at the edges, frankly. And like, they haven't even been able to get any of the witnesses so far to talk about like charitable donations, which when people in the public sphere, that's where they go first. You know, you're like Michael Lewis, like, oh, he wanted to solve pandemics. Um, a, a, no, he didn't, but, uh, also who gives a fuck? Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, that's where they are. They're just going back and getting the witnesses to say the same things they said to the prosecution. And that's really like half of the defense cross-examination so far. It could be a matter of like, uh, you know, when they say someone's defending themselves, that, uh, they're a fine lawyer, but they've got an idiot for a client or something like that. But mm-hmm. could, it could just be that trying to represent SBF is insanely difficult and if not impossible right and there is a there is a inconvenient fact here that i have to be careful about what conclusions people are invited to draw from this um but cohen and everdell is the law firm that represented Ghislaine maxwell um and a they lost that one too um but b you know they could be considered perhaps a law firm of last resort for people who don't have any better options. And, you know, there was a Wall Street Journal article about this connection, and they said that Cohen and Everdell have a reputation of, I'm going to paraphrase, but something like workmanlike lawyers, right? Um, They're not flashy. They don't have a lot of, I guess, juice, you might say. They're really just asking questions. And in some cases, that's very effective, apparently, according to this journal write-up. Um, but in this case, you, you have to be able to paint a picture. You have to be able to tell a story that is convincing and that contrasts with the prosecution's theory of the case. And in this case, you know, Everdell, again, is the cross X and he's just, uh, there's a lot of hesitations. There's a lot of ums and ahs, and there's a lot of, I'm sorry, judge also, um, and, and so it's just not coming off. Yeah, so I am actually, um, because of my layoff from Coindesk, I'm kind of doing a bunch of stuff. Um, I've already mentioned my my own newsletter, davidzmorris.substack.com. Check that out. Um, I am also contributing occasional columns to Laura Shin over at Unchained. Um, so go check out Unchained. Um, and, uh, and as we've mentioned at Protos, um, I don't have the address to all of my stuff, but I'll be filing hopefully every day or very close to it. So you'll get a, a granular view every day of what's going on um, inside the courtroom. Awesome. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank and you, David. follow me on Twitter at, at David Z. Morris also. Sorry. <laughs> Perfect. Nope. And uh, we'll, we'll link all that in the description and on the website for anyone listening. Awesome. Um, obviously, uh, I know that Cascoin was going through some issues last week, but I have provided myself a $65 billion credit line and everything is good for now. So no need to worry anyone out there. I know that it was troubling, but we're good. We're good. We'll be bulletproof in three months to 10 years. years.